On this episode of Pathways to Wellbeing, we usher in the new year with something that is top of mind for many of us, getting more movement and exercise into our daily routine. You could have someone who um, is just starting to exercise and they do five or 10 minutes and that works fine, but you could also have someone who's just starting to exercise, but they also have so much stress going on in the rest of their life. They're not sleeping, um, they're not fueling properly. There's all these other stressors that are also putting a stress on the system. And so even then maybe the five or 10 minutes might be too much. So you have to kind of look at the whole picture too, to see what dose is going to stimulate the right response so that it's actually a positive adaptation and you can end up with an overall anti-inflammatory effect. Dr. Julie Fouché is a four-time CrossFit Games athlete and family physician who recently finished her residency with the Cleveland Clinic. She is passionate about fitness, nutrition, and empowering patients to make lifestyle changes as the cornerstone of preventive medicine and wellness. Every Tuesday, Julie hosts new episodes of her own podcast, Pursuing Health, where she discusses health and fitness topics and stories of everyday individuals who have used lifestyle to overcome health challenges. Exercise has a range of health benefits, including improvements to blood pressure, circulation, and metabolic markers. It's also an effective therapy for mental emotional conditions. Today, we are so fortunate to have Dr. Fouché with us to shed some light on exercise as a foundational aspect of whole person wellness. Welcome. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. At the beginning of the year, I think we're all talking about this. More exercise, better nutrition. These are two common resolutions for the start of the new year. When patients approach you and they want to try a new diet or a new fitness routine, what advice do you give for them? I mean, really, where do you start? We tend to think about um, exercise prescriptions that are more formal and might be a useful way to really get patients to take our recommendations more seriously. What's your experience with patient engagement and how do you keep them motivated to stay on track with these goals? That's a great question. And I, I love that we're talking about this at the beginning of the year, because I think there's always such a push and some motivation being that it's a new year and people want to start a new routine or a new habit. Um, but we often see people fall off then as we get into, you know, late January, February, March. And so I always like to start no matter what time of year it is, I always like to really start and get to the patient's why of what's important to them and why they want to do exercise, because that's what's really going to sustain them for the long term. So, you know, maybe it's someone who, you know, is older and has a hard time playing with their grandkids because of, you know, some aches or pains. And so they want to exercise so they can be more active and play with their grandkids. Or maybe it's someone who has a trip planned with their mom coming up and they want to be able to do a hike or something like that. Really attaching it to what's most important to them, I think is important for sustaining long-term motivation. And it's going to be important for them even early on to, to kind of get them moving and connect to that why on those days, especially like know, those days where it's snowy and cold in January and you want to stay in bed, but instead you, you get out of bed to go exercise. So I always start with the why and really dig into that and try to connect it for every patient. And then from there, I think it depends on the person. Um, but really starting small and working up is, is important in building small successes, finding things that they've had success with in the past or that they really enjoy doing. Um, and figuring out how they can make it a routine or a habit that's part of their every day that's that's easy for them and that's going to be hard for them to to miss. Um, I think that also accountability is really important. So if someone has a partner that they can do exercise with or a friend or they do part of a class or have a trainer or someone else that's going to help hold them accountable, um, to whatever their goals are, that can be really helpful too. So it's really kind of having this discussion, trying to identify the why, and then trying to problem solve around that, trying to come up with what the potential barriers might be and work through those ahead of time. So they're going to be successful. I think that's super helpful when we think about from a motivational interviewing perspective, how we really help people anchor into that why. And so I think that that's brilliant just thinking about the logistics of what these types of visits look like. So you have an intake and you identify that someone really wants to work on their exercise habits. 
you mm-hmm. find their why they really anchor into that. What, what's your follow-up schedule, you know, look like, are you tracking them and checking in? How often are you doing that? Um, those, those touch points. Yeah, I think it really depends on the person and their goals. And in the practice that I am part of now, we use um, a lot of health coaching. And so the health coaches are great about being able to keep tabs on patients or check in at an interval that's appropriate for them or that that's comfortable. Um, And so whether it's just a, you know, a quick message just to say, hey, how's it going or scheduling regular visits so that they know you know, that visits on the calendar and, and they're, we're going to be talking about exercise at that visit that can help with accountability too. Um, and what you just said about motivational interviewing, I think is so, so important too. like not only identifying the why, but helping connect the patient to um, like that being, you know, the importance of why they're, why they may need to do exercise their why, and also why it might be good for their health and educating them on that, but also helping them find the confidence in what they're doing and doing something that's where smarting starting small can be really helpful is doing something that they know they've done before or they enjoy doing or something that's really small that they can start doing that is they're going to have confidence that they're going to be successful with it. And then building on that um, and having the accountability um, can be super, super helpful. And I think, uh, so my background comes from CrossFit, which a lot of times is really intimidating for people who haven't exercised before But what we find is that oftentimes the hardest part is just walking in the door. And once someone walks in the door and they see, oh, there's other people here like me. And this person also had, you know, diabetes or they had a knee injury and they did it and they're having success and they're having fun. And it's, it's something that worked for them. It helps to build the confidence too. So a lot of times it's just helping connect people to other individuals who are like them or showing them that it's what's possible to build their confidence. That's actually the perfect lead in to my next question of what are the most common obstacles or challenges that you find people face when they're implementing a new exercise routine? Is it lack of confidence or lack of skills, just needing to find their community? What are some of those obstacles that you see often? I mean, I think, I think that oftentimes people will use uh, an obstacle as not having enough time, which I think sometimes is a real obstacle, but sometimes it's a, it's a, just how important they're putting it on their, their scale of the other things that they need to do. Um, and something that I think is often a misconception where you need a lot of time to get effective exercise in, which is not always the case. So I think making it a, a habit, that's a regular part of the routine, whether it's, even if it's just five minutes in the morning, say you don't have time to go to the gym that day or to do something longer, maybe you can do something for five minutes, and then you're still in that routine, and you can still make it a part of your, your habit, because the the quicker you fall out of the habit, the harder it is to to get back on. So that's one, I think, especially now, um, with the pandemic, not being able to do the type of exercise that you want, like, maybe you're not able to go to the gym, like you would like to, um, or be part of, you know, the communities or teams that you normally would, I think that can be extremely hard for people. And, um, can lose a lot of motivation that way. Um, and so that's where, you know, home workouts come in some of these online communities or apps or things that help still can still help people feel engaged, um, and have that accountability, even if they can't be at the gym. Um, and interestingly too, it seems that, you know, the more we're learning about the pandemic and transmission that gyms are actually some of the lowest areas of transmission. So I've seen a few studies from Europe, Australia, there was one from New York that show extremely low transmission rates in gyms. Um, and so it's, that's part of the conversation maybe to be having with patients is what's the risk benefit of, we know exercise is really great for our immune system and for our health. Um, there is some risk of transmission, but it's relatively low when you consider um, other places that you may get um, an infection. And so what's the risk benefit if you're not able to do exercise at home or in a way in a way that you're comfortable with, maybe it's still worth it to to go to the gym with appropriate precautions. Um, so yeah, that's that's another one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw some of the, the numbers that I saw was even lower, like 0.06% or less than 1% of all transmissions happening in gym. So it's, it's pretty surprisingly low, um, especially with the gyms that are taking really great precautions. I've heard um, from some 
patients that that setting piece really matters. I can't feel motivated without other people around me, or I need my group class, or I need the machinery that I'm familiar with. So right. it, we're hopeful that people will be able to be in the setting where they feel comfortable and safe and motivated to do these things. Absolutely. And especially now as we're in the winter, I think, you know, when the weather was nice and depending where you live, but when the weather is nice, it's easier to get outside and go for a walk or do something active there. But especially now we're in the winter, if you're working from home, it's cold outside, you can't get out to exercise, it can be really hard. So finding some way to keep it fun and interesting and still change your your pace or your setting can definitely be helpful. And then I think another obstacle that I think people often have is maybe they have some injury or physical limitation that prevents them from doing the type of exercise that they want or that they think they should do. But um, I always encourage people to find something, you know, there's always something you can do, even if it's, um, even if it's not what you would prefer, what you would like, you can always modify different activities, you could try, you know, aqua, like, like swimming or aqua therapy, if you're having a hard time with your joints, there's always some way that you can get your body moving. Um, even if, it doesn't seem like, you know, it seems like maybe you have an injury. So I oftentimes I hear people say like, Oh, I have arthritis in my knees. I can't exercise. Well, there's so many things that you can still do, even if maybe you're not up for walking on a treadmill or doing something that's putting a lot of pressure on your knees. That's awesome. I have two follow-up questions came to my mind as you were talking. So the first of the questions is um, selfish, just from my own curiosity for someone like me who might be in a primary care setting and seeing patients, but doesn't have a lot of exercise background for someone who might need to tailor their activity. Like you mentioned, perhaps for an injury, are there other members of a collaborative care team you might bring on to help with that? You know, a personal trainer or a exercise physiologist, are there some other members of your community who you work with to make those types of modifications? Absolutely. I think, you know, physical therapists for sure can be um, allies in this and especially teaching patients how to move and teaching them basic, basic functional movements. I think, um, definitely personal trainers. Um, you know, I think it's important just to know your area and your community and who are the people that you can trust with your patient population and to start building those relationships. Um, so I know, you know, again, I come from a CrossFit background, so I know there's certain gyms and certain trainers that I feel really comfortable with sending patients who may be more sedentary or may not have a lot of background exercising. Cause I know they're going to do a great job, like starting from the basics and building them up to do these movements in a safe way. Um, so that's really, really important because I think, um, that can be discouraging for patients too. When they start exercising, they have a lot of mo motivation, especially earlier in the year. Um, and they're maybe pushing themselves too hard or doing a lot of new things. And then they end up with an injury and getting discouraged and, that can be a big roadblock for people. Yeah, that's super helpful. Thank you for giving us some insight into how you form a supportive care team. The second piece I wanted to loop back to is you mentioned, you know, time is a real limiting factor. And we, I think sometimes we do patients a disservice by separating exercise and nutrition when really there can be a symbiotic relationship there. So yeah. I'd love to talk about how nutrition can impact the effectiveness of exercise. Maybe we can get better bang for our buck since we only have a limited amount of time. Um, so I'd love to hear from your perspective, how nutrition can impact exercise for things like improving strength and endurance. Um, when we were looking into some background information, we thought maybe there, this is a conversation about carbohydrates or polyphenols and how those can affect athletic performance. So, you know, what, what's the connection between exercise and nutritional status and our endurance, even thinking about things like inflammation? Mm -hmm. A great question. And even before I jump in, just, I love the, the point that you made about exercise and nutrition sort of being synergistic and how really a lot of these lifestyle changes and habits work together. So oftentimes maybe a patient will start exercising and they'll start feeling a little bit better. That will give them more motivation to make some changes to their diet or vice versa. Same thing with sleep. Like if you're super sleep deprived, it's going to be really hard to eat well or change, make changes to your diet and have the motivation to go exercise. So they all kind of come together. Obviously you don't want to just, you know, do it all at once. They come in, in waves, but, but being able to see how these things interact, like once you do one thing, the next step often comes a little bit easier. Um, with regard to nutrition, I think one of the most important things to address is probably protein intake, especially when we're talking about 
strength training because, um, you know, if you're doing good strength training, you want to make sure that you're getting enough protein intake in order for um, you to build the muscle that you need. And so interestingly, uh, you know, a lot of people, when you, when you look at how much protein we need, the USDA actually recommends 0.8 grams per kilogram, um, which is a little bit on the low side. So this is, this is more of the intake that you need to prevent malnutrition. It's not necessarily the ideal amount, but when you look at um, further analysis of that, that data, and then also the recommendations from like the American or the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics or American College of Sports Medicine, they're recommending higher protein intake, like 1.2 to 2 grams per kilogram of body weight. So that's, it's a fair amount. And oftentimes, if people are not paying attention to how much protein they're taking, and they're probably not getting enough. So I, if someone especially is doing strength training exercise, or really trying to build muscle mass or lean body mass, I might have them just measure even if it's a ballpark measure how much protein they're taking for a few days just to get an idea of am I close or am I way off? And can I eyeball, you know, how much protein I need for a day to make sure I'm getting enough. Um, and looking for obviously clean sources for that protein, like really good quality animal proteins, if you're eating animal proteins, um, fish, eggs, you know, if you need protein powders that are that are going to be clean sources and that um, are good quality. So that's sort of the first thing I think about when it comes to exercise and nutrition. And then the next part is carbohydrate intake, which you mentioned, and there's some really interesting studies of carbohydrate intake, in particular with prolonged endurance exercise. So probably for someone who's doing, you know, shorter, more high intensity workouts, it's probably not critical to be ingesting carbohydrates during the workout. But if we're talking about people doing longer endurance exercise, it seems like it can be really helpful, um, especially basically it will increase your, um, your glucose and your insulin during the exercise. But then afterwards, you'll have less stress hormones and less inflammation, which can be helpful. So um, the one study actually looked at exercise inflammation after exercise and carb ingestion during the exercise decreased it by 30 to 40%, which was pretty remarkable. Um, so that's something to think about if you're doing like a longer duration endurance exercise. And then you also mentioned polyphenols, um, which seem to have some exercise benefits as well. So micronutrients that we can get through plant based foods, lots of antioxidants, um, and can also help to counter some of the the exercise induced changes in inflammation and the immune system. So it's actually really interesting how this works but you ingest the polyphenols with your fruit and vegetables, and then they actually are not absorbed right away, but they go into our colon where they're broken down into smaller parts um, by the bacteria in our colon. And then these smaller parts called phenolics undergo phase two conjugation in the liver, and then they're reabsorbed in our circulation. And those can have a lot of great effects um, and important effects for athletes, like anti-inflammatory effects, antiviral, antioxidant, um, and can help with our immune cell signaling. So of course, basically, in summary, we want to eat good quality protein sources, we want to eat lots of fruits and vegetables. And then if you're doing longer endurance exercise, it may be helpful to ingest some carbohydrates during your exercise. This is so helpful. I think what I'm taking away from this is that it's nuanced, and we have to tailor these recommendations to a patient's routine and their goals. And um, so that's super helpful. And you talked about maybe you have someone start tracking their protein just to see what their intake looks like. Are there, you know, are the app based trackers sufficient? Are you taking it a step further? How can we counsel mm -hmm. patients appropriately to get an accurate tracking of their protein intake? Yeah, I think it's, again, this depends on the patient. So I think it's, e it can be easy, you know, for the, for the right patient, you know, maybe you get a scale and you have them measure the weight in grams of protein that they're having. Um, or you could use an app to track that as well. I think you just want to be careful for the patient who may become like overly obsessive about tracking um, and take it too far, or it's not something that necessarily needs to be done forever. Um, so just being mindful of what those, like who those patients might be. And for those, even just measuring like, hey, a palm size portion of protein is a good amount for one meal that might have like 25 or 30 grams of protein, if you're going to have, you know, like chicken or salmon or something like that. And maybe you just ballpark um, for those patients or what, you know, what their preferences are. Yeah, that's, that is very helpful. Um, I want to also go back and revisit 
the conversation about inflammation, because I think sometimes we hear just in pop culture that exercise can be inherently a bit inflammatory just because of the process of breaking down muscle, building new muscle. Um, but exercise can be preventive medicine for inflammatory conditions. So you described a little bit about how exercise influences inflammatory pathways, but overall, would you say that there's a, a net anti-inflammatory benefit from regular moderate intensity exercise? Absolutely. So it is, it does sound a little bit counterintuitive, right? Cause we know after exercise we get sore and there's muscle breakdown and we actually see increases in inflammatory markers like C-reactive protein or other inflammatory markers. And so it's kind of confusing to think, well, if it's causing inflammation, how is that actually um, anti-inflammatory in the long run? But it really comes down to the dose and um, the frequency and the intensity and the response. So you can kind of think about the difference between having an acute stressor like exercise um, versus a chronic stressor. So if you think about just in general, when we have acute stressors and the way that our stress response system is set up in our body, if, you know, if you know, long time ago, if we were getting chased by a tiger, or, you know, you slam on the brakes, you're trying to miss a car accident, you feel this stress response come on, that's an acute response where, you know, your heart rate goes up, you have changes in um, your musculoskeletal system, you know, you're pumping out more energy to your muscles so that you could run away from whatever attacker you have. Um, You're more alert, all those things are happening. And then also you're revving up your inflammatory system, because Potentially, if you're going to get attacked by a tiger, you may end up getting a cut or some sort of injury that you need to be ready to repair. So all these systems are getting revved up in the acute state. Um, And that's kind of what happens when you are starting exercise, you're kind of revving up your stress response. Um, And that's okay, because when you after you're done exercising, things calm down. Um, and that allows you to adapt better. So next time you are approached with the same stressor. So maybe the first time you're going for a five minute jog and you rev up the stress response after you do that a few times, you could do the same five minute jog, but your stress response isn't going to be as robust. Um, which is the difference between the acute stressor, um, kind of building up and optimizing your systems versus a chronic stressor. So if you're constantly under this state of stress, or if you're exercising, for hours and hours every day, you could end up in this state of chronic um, stress or chronic inflammation, which could be problematic. So I always like to to think about it um, in terms of the dose and frequency and intensity and what is going to give you the right response. And that's going to change as you adapt to exercise too. And it's this concept of hormesis, where basically you can have this low level of cellular stress whether it's exercise, whether it's some sort of toxin or change in temperature that stimulates our molecular pathways to improve the ability of our cells to withstand greater stresses. Um, And so if you have these small little um, stressors like exercise, like maybe you're just starting exercise, you do five minutes one day, and then you do 10 minutes a few days later, and then you do 15 minutes of jogging, um, you're gradually giving yourself this dose that's, that's, that's um, triggering a response, which is allowing you to adapt favorably. Um, And so that's, that's basically how, how overall you can then develop a lower inflammatory response because your systems are more optimized. Um, But what might be the right dose for one person is not necessarily the right dose for another person. So if you have someone who's just starting to exercise, they need small doses, lower intensity. And as they start to build up that resilience or that um, um, exercise capacity, then they can handle a little bit more versus um, someone who's a trained athlete, maybe they can train for hours and hours a day, and their body's able to adapt. Um, And so part of part of the calculation or part of the the way that this works, too, is how much time there is for recovery. So you could have someone who um, is just starting to exercise, and they do five or 10 minutes, and that works fine. But you could also have someone who's just starting to exercise, but they also have so much stress going on in the rest of their life. They're not sleeping. um, They're not fueling properly, there's all these other stressors that are also putting a stress on the system. And so even then maybe the five or 10 minutes might be too much. So you have to kind of look at the whole picture too, to see what dose is going to stimulate the right response so that it's actually a positive adaptation and you can end up with an overall anti-inflammatory effect. I love that you just said the word hormesis. 
so happy and our <laughs> functional medicine audience will just love that you said that. And in our IFM programs, we often talk about the concept of mitohormesis, which goes right along with what you're talking about, where mm-hmm. you know, when we get small increases in oxidative stress, that's going to ignite our endogenous antioxidant capacity. And so overall it's a net anti-inflammatory antioxidant benefit. And I love that you just brought that up in terms of exercise. Um, I think that that is such a helpful mental model to help us understand how that can be overall an anti-inflammatory process. So absolutely. You can, I love how you can think about it on like a macro scale. Like when you're doing a workout, maybe you're doing a like a weightlifting, like a bicep curl or something. Right. And you know that in order to get the favorable adaptation, you want it to, you want to be a little bit sore, your muscle is going to have some muscle breakdown and that's great. And then you're going to build up and you're going to be stronger than you were before. But if you overdo it and you do too much or too much load, you could end up hurting yourself or you could end up um, not having that adaptation. So it's about finding what the right dose is um, and intensity and frequency so that you get the adaptation that you want. Yeah, that's excellent. And you spoke a bit about how the the dose really matters, especially depending on someone's exercise experience level. Sometimes for people who are just starting out, uh, practitioners who are just starting out in formatting exercise prescriptions, we'll hear about this fit, the frequency, intensity, Mm -hmm. time, and type. Is Mm -hmm. that something that you use with patients to help them structure what exercise might suit their needs? Um, I think it can be really helpful. I think it just depends on the person. Some people already have things that they really like to do. And I think it, for, to me, the most important thing is finding the type of exercise that is something that the patient wants to do and that they're going to do. So that's always where I kind of start. Um, and then really working up slowly on the frequency intensity time. So um, and, and that, again, is going to be based on the patient and their previous experience, but it's a good way to think about it. So you're you're kind of agreeing on, okay, this is what you're going to do. This is how often we're going to do it um, for how long. And then you're going to slowly build up on that over time. Yeah, that's great. Well, I think you've really done a fantastic job of helping us understand the more specific details about why exercise is important and how it can be helpful for chronic conditions. But the logistics of it, I think that's really the hardest part for so many is, okay, we understand why exercise is so valuable, but it's hard to really get going. And one thing that we think about is when we are um, trying to induce sustainable change, leveraging, you know, community networks that someone might have. And so making things a family affair. And we see that when we do nutritional changes within families, if one parent, for example, is prescribed a Mediterranean diet, that those healthy eating skills can kind of spill out into other family members. Do you find that that's true with exercise when one family member starts doing more physical activity? Do you see it roll out into the habits of the other family members? Oh yeah, absolutely. And I think that, you know, it's true in families, but it's true. in just in general, like when we start, you know, for us as practitioners also, like if we set a good example, you, I noticed that other people, my coworkers may start making changes or patients see that you're, you know, practicing what you preach and that goes a long way, but definitely within families, um, you know, the way, especially if you can get parents regularly exercising, it just becomes a regular part of life and the kids see that and they grow up with it. And then it becomes something that they enjoy doing together. And that can be so powerful. And sometimes that can be a good motivator for parents too, is just trying to be that example for their kids and creating those good habits. And I see, (coughs) um, again, with, with CrossFit, a lot of people, you know, people who are really engaged in their CrossFit communities, it becomes such a normal part of their life. And they're there on the weekends and the evenings, that's where their friends are, that's where they hang out with their kids, and their kids just start emulating what their parents do. It's so funny to see, you know, without even any instruction, the kids just start doing burpees, or they start doing picking up um, weight, like, little weights and trying to pretend they're doing whatever their parents are doing. And it's so awesome to see that as a standard and something that kids grow up with um, and something that they just think is a normal part of life because it's going to then be with them forever. So, um, you know, whether it's doing exercise together as a family or just finding things that you enjoy doing that are active, like, you know, going on a hike or going skiing in the winter or doing things that you can do as a family that are also going to be active, I think can go a long way. Yeah, there does seem to be some benefit for some people with 
doing things in a group, that group mentality and Mm -hmm. not only being the physical activity piece, but also the community building and the connection Mm -hmm. and the shared interests and values. So I think that that's really beautifully said. Uh, Along those similar lines, we're in this work from home era. And I think so many people are not getting the steps in that they used to, maybe their classes are closed. And we know that independently from just exercise habits alone, sedentary behavior can be a significant risk factor for developing chronic disease. So I'd love to just get your, (laughs) your opinion on how much physical activity is really needed to kind of counteract that potential harm of us sitting at a desk all day and working strange hours and maybe sitting at a desk into the night. Just want to get your, your thoughts. Yeah, that's a tough question because, you know, we know that, and even the most recent exercise guidelines um, suggest that, you know, there's really two parts. There's one combating sedentary behavior. So there's trying to move more throughout the day. And then there's two making sure you get some form of moderate or vigorous physical activity in, um, throughout the week. So I don't know if there's a certain amount that that necessarily counteracts the sedentary behavior, but certainly at least meeting like the minimum requirements that we see to benefit mortality would be like 150 minutes per week um, of moderate to vigorous activity and then some strength training too. Um, But we know like if you sit all day and then you just exercise for 30 minutes, probably you're still going to have some negative impact from that sedentary behavior. So I always like to talk to people about both sides, like one, yes, we want to make sure you're getting your heart rate up and you're doing some exercise, but two, let's kind of think about ways that we can break up what you're doing throughout the day so that it's not just sitting at a desk all day or not just sitting um, in one place. And it can be simple. It can be as much as, you know, setting a timer on your phone or your watch and making sure you get up or putting, you know, putting things in the other rooms, you have to get up to go get them every so often. Um, I really like uh, this technique called the Pomodoro technique which there's even different timers and apps you can get on your phone, but basically you work and it helps with focus too. You work for 25 minutes then you take a five minute break and you do three rounds of that. And then after three rounds, you take a longer break, maybe 15 or 30 minutes. So with that, it just helps you to focus for those 25 minutes. Cause you know, you're going to get a break coming up. And then in the five minutes, you could do something like go for a little walk, do some squats, pick up a kettlebell, um, do some stretching, whatever it is so that you're moving a little bit. Um, I think that helps a lot and finding ways to where you can get up and move. So maybe, you know, if you have a meeting or a phone call, any opportunity, I know any opportunity that I have to be walking throughout the day, I try to take it. If it's taking a phone call where I don't necessarily need to be taking notes or on a video, um, or if I'm listening to a book or a podcast or something, I'm always trying to make sure that moving, walking or getting on a bike or doing something like that to break up that sedentary behavior during the day. Yeah, that's excellent. I think some primary care docs like myself who maybe don't have a big background in exercise might feel some apprehension of taking a patient who's been sedentary and prescribing an exercise routine. Like, is this, is this even safe? Am I <laughs> harm? Um, but is your general recommendation start slow, work your way up, see how people do increase as they can tolerate? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Just meeting the patient where they're at. So if it's someone who's never exercised before and like walking is going to be a big strain on them, then start slow, you know, start walking, even if it's walk down the driveway and back for a few days, and then start going a little bit longer. And I think uh, from my experience too, once patients do that, and they get some motivation, they say, Oh, I got to under driveway, that wasn't so bad. Let me go a little bit further today. And they start pushing themselves further. And so just starting small and working up. And if it's someone that maybe has a lot of physical limitations, like starting with a physical therapist or starting with a trainer who's going to be able to supervise them and take them through in a safe way can be really, really helpful. And then give you peace of mind too, um, as a doctor who's recommending it and, um, just not, not to be uh, afraid to, to help them get moving, even if it's, you know, doing some squat, like having them stand up and sit down off a chair for squats and having them practice those a few times a day or during the commercials on a TV show, there's so many ways that you can break it down into smaller pieces that are still going to be safe. And then you can build on. Yeah, that's great. We, we just had our cardiometabolic advanced practice module. And some of the questions that we got from practitioners were, 
can I, can I medically clear patients in a primary care setting to exercise? Do I need to refer to a cardiologist for this? But it sounds like um, with some careful monitoring and making sure that they're, you know, starting at an, a level that's appropriate for them, that most patients can be cleared just by their family doc in a primary care setting. Yeah, for sure. Unless they have some cardiac history or something that needs a specialist um, that, yeah, starting small and, and working their way up should be, should be fine. Well, Dr. Fouché, you have done a beautiful job illustrating how exercise really fits into a comprehensive care plan. We have to honor the role of physical activity as part of our modifiable lifestyle factors. It's really the foundation for whole person health. And I think with the insights we've gained today, we'll all be more able to do that. So thank you so much for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you all next time. Thank you for having me. To join the conversation on this topic, visit IFM's pages on Facebook and Instagram. For more information about functional medicine, visit ifm.org.